Hi, I am Mrs. Sloan, and this is a video for my honors biology class. And this is chapter 12 for us, and we are discussing cardiovascular systems. So let me make myself a little smaller and get in presentation mode. Um, if you are new to my videos, um, down in the descriptor below, I have um, the notes that my students use. Two columns, column one is the scaffolding. I'll help you fill that in. Column two, I encourage my students to throw pictures in there that are helpful helpful for them. Okay, and I need a pointer. Here we go. So this is 12.1 um, is where we're going to start in the notes. But first, um, I'm going to break this, this particular chapter into two videos. So in this one, we're going to talk about blood vessels and the human heart. All right, here we go. So blood vessels, three main that you need to know, arteries, veins, and capillaries. So let me show you something I show my students right away. Um, this would be a great, a great way for you to remember this. Um, it will help you um, this whole chapter, okay? Take my fingers look like an A. I'm putting them over my heart. Your heart is right in the middle, not here like a Pledge of Allegiance, but here. And you say, Arteries go away from the heart. That's the definition. It's not arteries carry oxygenated blood. It's arteries go away from your heart. Okay, then you flip your hand up. Now we're at a V. Veins go towards. And then the order that it goes is arteries, arterioles, which are little tiny arteries. Capillaries in the middle. We go like this because this is where all the exchange takes place. You cannot exchange oxygen, nutrients, waste unless you're at a capillary. Capillaries in the middle venules, veins. So let's put that together. Arteries go away from the heart, veins go towards. Arteries, arterioles, capillaries in the middle, venules, veins. A little more to that song, but that's good for now. All right, so structure and function, they go hand in hand. So let's go over that. So take a look here at this artery. You can see it's thick walled, muscular, because remember arteries go away from the heart. So that's when the there's the greatest force on the blood due to the heart. So they have to be able to withstand that. Small arteries are arterioles, capillaries, are one cell thick, that's where your exchange takes place. Then your return trip to the heart is in a vein. Notice the, um, when you look at the opening of the vein versus the opening of the artery right here, that's called the lumen is the opening, it's much bigger. The blood is flowing much faster, or sorry, much faster in the artery, much slower in the vein. You'll also notice that there are some valves there um, to keep that um, one-way direction, the flow of the blood. Okay, so we're gonna break each of those down. Um, for arteries, function takes blood away from the heart takes blood away from the heart. And um, you can see the thick muscular walls here. What I want you to pay attention to is this right here. This is your endothelium, it's the innermost layer. By the time we get to a capillary, capillaries are one cell thick and that's all they are, is this endothelium, this innermost layer. All right, so you can see you have elastic tissue, smooth muscle, connective tissue, because every time the heart contracts, there's a surge on that blood vessel. You feel that surge when you take your pulse, right? You're feeling that surge of those blood vessels expanding and then snapping back. So structure, thick muscular walls, and the smallest arteries are called arterioles. Okay, here's your capillary. All it is is the endothelium, one cell thick. This is for diffusion, for molecules to move from a higher concentration to a lower concentration for all of our exchange. So capillaries, all exchange of gases, nutrients, and waste. The structure, one cell thick, and it's endothelium. I already gave that to you. And then not all your capillary beds are open at the same time. You have little sphincters, okay, that direct the flow. Um, if all your if all your sphincters were open and blood went everywhere in your body right now, wherever there is a capillary, your blood pressure would drop so drastically you would just immediately pass out. So we are constantly shunting the blood. If you just had a meal, you're gonna shunt it towards your digestive system. If you're working out, you're gonna shunt the blood towards your muscles. It's never that you cut anything off, it's just momentarily, right? If you're working out and your face gets all red, then you're shunting the blood to the surface of your body in order to cool it, right? That's also we maintain homeostasis. So not all capillary beds are open at the same time. Sphincter muscles regulate. Sphincter muscles regulate. You've got lots of sphincters, right? Okay, 
And then veins. Um, here's that endothelium again, right? We still have elastic tissue, but look at the muscle. It's not under a great force there. And you're trying to keep the blood flowing in one direction. And we'll talk about some strategies for that. But one of the main ones is the valves. They're unidirectional valves. So the way I think about it is like if you took a tube of toothpaste, right? And you took the cap off and you squeeze it in the middle, toothpaste is only going to shoot in one direction. And that's what these valves do. So if you have skeletal muscles on either side of a vein and they are contracting and they compress the vein wall because of those one-way valves, blood can only go in one direction. What direction is that back towards your heart? So veins function takes blood towards the heart and they have a larger lumen, that's the opening, the space, larger lumen and valves, valves that prevent backflow, prevent backflow, venules are the smallest vein. And then the pathway, you got it. Arteries go away from the heart, veins go towards arteries, arterioles, capillaries in the middle, venules, veins. There's three exceptions to that rule. I'll teach you those three exceptions later. Okay. So here you can compare and contrast an artery with a vein. So check that out. Look at the muscle there. The opening's bigger. You can see the valves right here. Perfect. Okay. Now here is an actual uh, microscopic view. So here you can see the artery. Look at the lumen. Look at the size of the lumen here. You can see the thick muscular walls. Okay. So easy to differentiate between an artery and a vein. Okay. Now we are on 12.2, the human heart, the human heart one direction always in our bodies one direction for the flow so this looks terrifying right these are all these uh labels most of these you're going to know in just a few minutes i'll be teaching those to you but this is showing you the outside of the heart and the interior of the heart now you'll notice in these pictures as well as the other pictures i showed you earlier that um, where you have oxygenated blood, they show it as red and deoxygenated, they show it as blue. It is, it is never, your blood is never blue. It may look like blue through your skin, but it is never blue. It's just the appearance of it um, through your skin. All right. So if you like bleed in space, it's not going to be blue. But for the purposes of our understanding, it is easy just to differentiate that way between deoxygenated and oxygenated blood. And that much is true. Here on the outside, you see the this little. This right here is an atria. This one's the same size. It's just the way the heart is turned. You can't tell. It's just as big as this one. Now, to remember the parts of the heart, it's very, very important you remember that when they when you label, okay, so if you if you look at this one right here, it's labeled right here, right atrium. It's as if it's on you, your right atrium and your left atrium, okay? So when you look at a heart, pretend it's your patient's heart or it's on you. So this side of the heart is the left side, the part closest to me here in the center, and over here, this is the right side of the heart, okay? If you can remember that, your lefts and rights, the other thing you're gonna need to remember is that atria collect and ventricles pump. I'm gonna teach you that. And then you already know, arteries go away and veins go towards, then you are gonna learn the heart no problem. Now the easiest thing to do is take your heart and break it down into four boxes, okay? You have two collecting chambers, your two atria, and your ventricles are your pumpers. Now, if you screenshot this and then you can annotate it like on an iPad, that's what I did. And I encourage you to do that just as practice. But for right now on your notes, go down to your anatomy, atria collects blood from the body or the lungs, okay? From your systemic or your pulmonary circuit, okay? Pulmonary is anything to do with your lungs. And then um, the ventricles pump the blood to your body, your systemic circuit or your pulmonary circuit. And your heart valves are going to direct the flow of blood, direct the flow of blood. And I will teach you those. So this side in blue, okay, that's the right side of the heart. If you imagine it on yourself, okay, and this side over here, the oxygenated blood is referred to as the left side of the heart. So when you collect blood, from your body, okay? Um, you, if you're collecting it from your systemic circuit everywhere except your lungs, you have what's called a superior and an an, um, superior and inferior vena cava, or anterior and posterior vena cava. These are the largest veins of your body. And they dump your systemic circuit, everything but your lungs, into this right atrium. It is a collector. Atria collect. 
Now, when the right atria contract, it doesn't have to work that hard because it's just got to get the blood down into this right ventricle. When it goes through this, this is a one-way one -way door again, right? So when the right ventricle contracts, now this blood is blue in this picture. So is it oxygenated or deoxygenated? It's deoxygenated, right? This blood is going to need to go to your lungs. So when the right ventricle contracts hard, you don't want the blood to go back into the right atrium where it came from. So there are valves there. So when the blood hits it, they slam shut. You know when you hear your heart beating? You're really listening to your valve door slamming shut. And I'll explain those in just a little bit. Okay, but your right ventricle contracts and it's going to send blood up and out your left and right pulmonary arteries because arteries go away from your heart, right? And they're going to send the blood to your lungs. It's going to, that's your pulmonary circuit. When they come back from your lungs, they're going to come because you have lungs too, right? It's going to come on the left side and also from your right lung. It's going to come behind the right atrium here and it's going to dump this oxygenated blood into your left atrium. Your left atrium is going to contract, not a difficult contraction. It just has to send the blood down into your left ventricle. When your left ventricle contra contracts, this is the just the strongest muscle of your heart altogether. That's why we say, I pledge allegiance. And we that's because that's where we feel it on our left side. And when this contracts, it sends blood to your entire body except your lungs. This contraction has got to send it on its way. So this is a very strong contraction. Again, you have valves right here to prevent the backflow so it doesn't go back into your left atrium. And it's going to go up and out the largest artery of your body, which is called your aorta. Now, the way you're going to remember these two sets of valves right here, got a couple other to teach you. This valve right here is referred to the tr as the tricuspid valve because it's got three parts to it. This one um, is referred to as the bicuspid valve because it has two parts or the mitral valve. The way I remember that is R-A-T, if this is tricuspid valve, spells rat and L A. B, bicuspid, spells lab. So rat, lab, or lab, rat, and that will help you remember your valves, all right? So that's just a general overview of the four chambers and the direction of flow. So on your notes where it says heart valves, direct the flow of blood. What I just taught you, the tricuspid and the bicuspid are your atrioventricular valves because they're between your atrium and your ventricle, atrioventricular or AV valves. And um, so it's between the atrium and the ventricles, one-way flow. Okay, got semilunar valves I'll show you here in just a minute. Okay, so now let's look at that flow that I talked to you about. So this is your superior vena cava, your inferior vena cava, or anterior posterior. They dump right here. Do you remember what this is? The right atrium. It goes through this valve when it contracts. Do you remember what that is? R-A-T, rat, right tricuspid valve into your right ventricle. It's going to go up and out. There's a semilunar valve here. I'll show you that in a minute. Up and out. This one over here, what side of the body is that on? If it were on you, that would be on your left side. So this is your left pulmonary, because we're going to go to the lungs. And anything to do with the lungs is pulmonary. Left pulmonary artery. And this one is your right pulmonary artery. Arteries go away from the heart, right? You're going to be in capillaries around the alveoli of your lungs. You're going to drop off CO2. You're going to pick up oxygen. And that's why you see it changing from blue to red. But remember, it's never blue. Okay, so these are your capillaries. You're going to come back in venules and veins, and you have your, what side is this? The right pulmonary, because you're coming from the lungs, and you're going towards the heart. Remember, arteries go away, veins go towards, right pulmonary veins, left pulmonary veins into this chamber. Do you remember what this one is? It's your left atrium. Down, what valve is this? L-A-B, bicuspid, and into your left ventricle. Your left ventricle is the strongest part of your heart. And even this diagram, they're showing that. See how thick it is right here? Because it's got to send it to your systemic circuit, and it's going to go up, and there's another semilunar valve, and out your aorta. This is your aorta. And the aorta, it, there are branches coming off it here to feed your brain, and then it bends behind the heart and heads down in order for your lower extremities, okay? So... Um, what you can put for semilunar valves, it's between the ventricles and the arteries, aorta or pulmonary arteries. So you can't see them in this picture, but I will show it. Okay. So take a look at this picture. 
you want to get to the point where if you got this picture, you could just label it really quickly. Okay, and I will show you my labeling. You can pause if you want to and, and annotate it. But remember, we have superior and inferior vena cava coming in here. Okay, so now the heart is a continuous circuit, just like a ring, right? It goes around in a circle. But I would say this is like number one, just to keep us. And then this is the next place it would go. Number two, right? Through the tricuspid, number three. So if you want to think of it like that to kind of remember the flow. Okay, now I'm going to show you this next picture. I've already labeled it. Crazy, I know, not super good writing here, but I also colored it so you would remember if it had oxygenated or deoxygenated blood. So you see superior or anterior vena cava, inferior or posterior vena cava, two names. That these both drain into the right atrium, tricuspid valve, right ventricle. You go up and out. When the right ventricle contracts, it's sending lung, blood um, to your lungs. And so when it relaxes, it'll want to suck the blood back in. So that's why you have a semilunar valve here and a semilunar valve here in order to prevent backflow into the right and left ventricle. Because remember, it's going to be like this. Atria ventricles rest. Atria ventricles rest. Okay, like this. This is how your heart pumps. So the two atria contract at the same time and then the two ventricles contract at the same time. So you're gonna send blood up and out your left pulmonary artery and out your right pulmonary artery, arterioles, capillaries around the lungs, the alveoli, little air sacs, venules, vein, you're gonna come back. The left pulmonary vein and the right pulmonary vein are both gonna drain into the left atrium. Left atrium contracts, sends blood through the bicuspid valve, and then the left ventricle contracts, slamming the bicuspid valve shut when it contracts because blood can't go back. And then it's going to go up and out the semilunar valve and the aorta, which bends down and is also right here. Okay, so on your blood pathways, here's another one. You could freeze this and you could label it. And I'm going to help you label it here on your notes as well. I just gave you little hints, though. I didn't totally label it. I just put um, the abbreviation. So hopefully you'll remember. On your notes, filling it in, you already have for your blood pathway one and two, vena cava's right atrium. You have tricuspid valve. Number four on your notes is the right yeah, the numbers on your notes do not match the numbers in here. My apologies. This is just to show you the blood flow, okay? So you would remember five is lung, six coming in here, seven, eight, um, nine is your aorta, 10 body, okay? So these numbers, these numbers, just go on your numbers on your notes. Vena cava, right atrium, tricuspid valve. Number four is right ventricle on your notes. Um, semilunar valve, pulmonary arteries, pulmonary arteries, arteries, arterioles on your notes, number eight, capillaries around the alveoli of your lung. Those are little like grape sacs kind of looking. Um, one cell thick, alveoli is A-L-V-E-O-L-I, venules, veins, pulmonary veins, left atrium, um, bicuspid valve, left ventricle, semilunar valve, aorta to the body, arteries, arterioles, capillaries, venules, veins, vena cava. Okay, so hopefully your notes are all filled in there with your blood pathway. Okay, and then you just practice it. Okay, and use this maybe to help you remember, oh, this is RV, this must be the right ventricle. All right, now, um, heart beating. So we know the flow, how it moves, and we know the vessels. So now let's talk about the heart beat. So you can look at your resting heart rate and see what it is right now. My watch is telling me it's time to stand. And you can go and, and maybe you have the ability, a heart rate monitor that you can check your heart rate right now. Mine is beating at 63 beats per minute at this moment. Okay. Average heart rate is 70 beats per minute. Um, at 70 beats per minute, then in a day, your heart will beat about 100,000 um, 100, times. And in a year, it'll beat about 36,500,000 times. Now, you want to have the most effective pump as possible. And in video two, I'm gonna talk about heart health and what you can do um, to maintain heart health. You want it to be an efficient machine. If your resting heart rate is 100 beats per minute, that's a problem, okay? Because now you're gonna multiply that out 
and your heart's beating very, very fast. It's important, take a look at your resting heart rate. Lots of things can affect your, your heart rate. When you sleep at night, your heart rate's gonna go down. Your lowest heart rate of all is right when probably you wake up in the morning, as long as it's not an alarm and you're like, ah, okay? But laying down, you could look at it. Exercising, your heart rate's gonna change, right? But your resting heart rate, if it's something really high, like 100 beats or 120 beats per minute, that's going to be a problem and you're gonna wanna work on making some choices if you can to have a lower resting heart rate. Now, your blood pressure is another thing. You, you don't want it too low, but you don't want it too high either. And this is the force on the blood due to the heart contracting. And so you can measure that, and you can measure it in several different places, but you measure it at an artery usually. And so when you go, you could get it measured at your wrist though, and it'll, you know, it'll, that'll work as well. But when you go to the doctors, they usually put it right, you know, on your, on your um, forearm right here. And what they're doing is they're compressing it and then releasing it and when they can feel the force. This will be, uh, it will vary due to the elasticity of arterial walls, volume of your blood, viscosity of the blood, your age, your health. Um, how, you know, do you have a lot of buildup of cholesterol in your arterial walls? These are all things um, that can be affected by it. What I tell my students is think about, um, like a, a water balloon, right? That you just fill up and then, or a party balloon and you're just like, you can blow it up really easy, right? And the opening, the lumen to that party balloon is wide. It's easy to blow up. Now think of those little teeny tiny balloons where the lumen is very, very small and you try to blow those up and it like, mm, okay, and it's hard to do. The, the, the diameter, the larger diameter that isn't clogged up with fats it's easier for the blood to move through. When you start making the diameter smaller, then it's harder for it to, to pass through, okay? So those are all things that could affect your blood pressure. So on your notes, um, you have heartbeat stats, beats about 70 beats per minute. Um, when you measure, like here, they're saying 140 over 88 is this person's blood pressure, and then this is their heart rate, 86. So this is their systolic pressure and this is their diastolic pressure. Systolic is when there's the greatest force, like after a contraction, and then diastolic is when it's relaxing in between those contractions. So here, okay, so here you can see, let me move myself. Blood pressure measure, measures the force of the blood on the blood due to the left ventricle, right? Because my left ventricle is sending the blood out to my systemic circuit. So your systolic pressure is when the heart is, your left ventricle is contracting and your diastolic pressure is when it's relaxing. So you always expect your systolic number to be higher than your diastolic number. So systole, heart chambers contracting. Diastole, the chambers are relaxing chambers are re relaxing now those sounds I told you about remember the sounds you hear those are valve doors slamming shut the first valve doors that are going to slam shut are going to be your tricuspid and your bicuspid another name for that is mitral valve those are going to slam sh shut first right because your left and right ventricle, when they contract, they're gonna send blood up and out, either your aorta here from your left ventricle or your left and right pulmonary arteries from your right ventricle, and these will slam shut first. Then when the ventricles, they contract, and then when they relax, they'll try to suck some of that blood back down from where it came, and that's when your semilunar valves slam next. So it's, now if it's, Sorry, da, 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 If you're feeling that, then that you have a heart murmur, and it means that your valve doors are not slamming tight. Um, so on your notes, you have sounds lub dub, and then AV valves, then semilunar. AV valves, then semilunar. Okay, and a heart murmur is when you're hearing those valve doors not shut completely. Okay, next. Oh. I have another one here. Okay, so first sound, okay, is here you can see the blood's coming down from the atria down into the into the ventricles. So the first sound you hear, the lub of the lub dub, is when the AV valves close, my bad, sorry, when the AV valves close, okay, then when the ventricles relax, 
then the second sound you hear right here is the semilunar valves closing. All right, now your pulse. When you take your pulse and you take it down from your where your thumb is, and don't use your thumb ever to take your pulse because it has a pretty strong pulse itself. So that's why you would use your fingers here. Or you could take it right here, right? You're feeling an expansion of an arterial wall. So pulse is an expansion of an arterial wall due to the heart contracting and forcing blood through the vessels. Okay. Um, so expansion of an arterial wall. So um, when our heart beats, okay, when our heart beats, okay, so it starts in your brain actually, but with your medulla oblongata, I'll show you that in just a minute, and it's going to stimulate your SA node. Now, your SA node is pretty incredible because it is heart tissue, but it also acts like nervous tissue, and when your SA node is stimulated, it sends a wave of depolarization across both your atria. So then your atria will contract simultaneously together, sending the blood, remember it's all about one-way flow, from the atria down into the ventricles. When this wave of depolarization hits your AV node, this sends an electrical stimulus is going down through the center of your heart here, this is called your septum, and then up and around on either side of your ventricles, these are called your Purkinje fibers, and then they will get the ventricles to contract. So it's SA node makes the atria contract, and then the AV node through the Purkinje fibers will make your ventricles contract simultaneously, right? Now, um, the SA node is what's called the pacemaker of the heart because it's stimulating this whole process for the heart. Now, it's kind of cool, but if you dissected out heart tissue and you put it in isotonic solution with you know the right amount of sugar, heart cells will just sit there if it's living heart cells, they will just sit there and contract. But when you put them together, they will start contracting simultaneously together. They will sync up. Now, when this isn't happening, you when you have a mixed message, this is when it gets out, and this is when you need a defibrillator, right? That's a fibrillation when it's not beating simultaneously atria ventricles rest, right? And that can that can be a problem, right? And we'll talk about that here in just a minute. But for your notes, let's put this down. So the heartbeat, the heart beats on its own, but the rate, the rate is determined by the nervous system, and that is your medulla oblongata. And let me, sh I think I have it. Yes, I do. Okay, so here you can see this right here. Here's your cerebrum. This is your pons. Here's your medulla oblongata, and then you have your spinal cord um, down here, right? Your medulla oblongata is what's going to control and send a stimulus to the heart to beat and the rate at which it's going to be, right? And, but the actual stimulating the heart itself is going to come from, let's go back here, right here, your pacemaker. So um, number, sinoatrial node is the cardiac pacemaker, pacemaker that initiates heartbeat. Pacemaker that initiates heartbeat, causing the atria to contract. And then it goes down and it'll hit the AV node. And when stimulated by the SA impulses, sends impulses through the septum to cause those ventricles to contract. So you can measure this wave of depolarization across the heart if you've ever heard of an EKG before, right? So on what this P represents right here, this is when the atria are contracting. Now, this is a smaller contraction than QRS is when the ventricles are contracting. That's bigger, right? Because they're either having to send it out to your lungs or the left ventricle is having to send it to the entire body, right? So that's a larger stimulus there. So QRS, and then this T represents when the ventricles are relaxing. Now, you don't, this is atria contract, QRS, ventricles contract, and T is ventricles relax. When the atria contract, it is happening when the, when the atria are relaxing, it is happening when the ventricles are contracting. Okay, so on your notes for your electrocardiogram, EKG or ECG, it's a recording of the electrical changes that occur during contraction of the heart. So the P, the P wave right here, that is when the atria contract. QRS 
is when the ventricles contract, and you can put in parentheses atria relaxing, and then the T, right? That is when um, the, um, the ventricles are relaxing. So what's going on here? Okay, what you see here is if this is what's going on in your EKG, then your heart is just doing this. And this is when they need to do clear, okay? And they need to basically do a reboot there on your heart. They're gonna put an electrical stimulus across it, which makes the whole heart contract and then relax. And then they're hoping that your pacemaker will start up again and, and make your heart start working in, at the right rhythm, right? And what would a flat line be? A flat line would be there's no electrical stimulus across your heart and it's no longer beating. And, and then you could do that as, as well, trying to get it to restart, all right? Um, and then that is the end of this video. I will talk about vascular pathways um, and the blood and the components of blood and cardiovascular um, disorders in video number two. And if you're one of my students, I will see you in class.